Um, I am Stephanie Duncan, and we're in Evansville, Indiana. Um, I have been vermicomposting for about seven years. Um, how many of you even know what vermicomposting is? Okay. Okay. So this is composting with worms. So we don't we do not compost with heat. The worms break down. The food breaks down. The worms eat it. They poop it out. So I sell poop. <laughs> um, it makes a nutrient rich fertilizer um, as well as what we can call it a soil conditioner. Um, it increases your plant growth as well as your vegetable yield. Um, it can, has a suppressing of the value to it that helps with pests, bugs, chewing bugs, sucking bugs. Um, it also helps with diseases that you get with bottom rot, root rot, um, black dot disease. I don't know what it's called, but you know when your plants get all those little dots on it. Um, so it helps keep spread of, of diseases in greenhouses and tons of aphids that start chewing around and such. So, um, the number one question I get from people is, is how much and how often? So, um, I always recommend for my vegetable garden and my flower gardens during blooming season and production season, uh, every two to three weeks. If you have plants that are suffering, getting chewed up by those Japanese beetles, uh, squash bugs, they don't like how it tastes. So uh, you can't overdo the vermicompost tea, spraying it on, uh, even the so putting planting your plants with the soil, it will not burn your plant up. But when you spray it on your foliage during growth season, um, it makes flowers brighter, it keeps bugs detoured, and uh, then uh, for your um, yards and grass trees and shrubs, I do this, uh, recommend your normal way you would do your yard with uh, synthetic fertilizer. Um, so we have actually used that on yards and it does fantastic, it limits your weed grows because once you get your soil condition, um, the weeds tend to the grass just chokes it out. Um, then they say, how much? That's going to be so expensive. Well, not really. When we liquefy it, it's very reasonable because uh, three cups of vermicompost uh, makes five gallons. You five gallons will treat an acre. I can sell people who are unknowing a lot of extra because then it's a sale, right? But I just can't do it. So they'll want to buy three or four gallons. And I'm like, well, how much are you trying to, you know, are you, do you have an acre that you're trying to do? <laughs> Some people do for their yards, but for just the novice gardener, they usually have two or three raised beds and really they need a gallon. That's it. So, because you can, that's the uh, um, concentrate, gallon concentrate, and then you could uh, li liquefy that, dilute it down, uh, one to three ratio, or even one to four. Um, like I said, vermicompost will burn up your plants. Um, however, studies show using more than the 30% one to four ratio has similar results as 100%. Now, in my own research, we had a field that had zero micro uh, activity, was high in herbicide and, and um, pesticide. So we put it on full strength most times and uh, did get very good results, which we'll go into in just a little bit. Um, Burma compost also increases your bricks value. How many in here know about bricks? Good. A lot of people don't. <laughs> uh, high bricks value indicates good taste and quality of your crop. The taste of your end products will be sweeter when the bricks value is high. A crop with high bricks value also be, can be preserved longer. Additionally, plants with high bricks are more resistant 
an insect attack. So remember I said spraying your vermicompost tea on there, uh, it makes your bugs more resistant to disease and pests. Well, when we get that bricks value up high, um, it cuts down on pests liking it. And I have a scale. So this is from Dykstra. No, Wait, it Tom, is Dykstra. Tom Dykstra. Dr. Tom Dykstra did a study on bricks. And this is similar. <laughs> I had to search around for it. Um, but so when your bricks level gets up um, between, you know, to six, the um, <coughs> aphid group starts stop sucking and biting your plant. Then the sucking insects drop off between seven and nine. Chewing insects from nine to 11 bricks. And then when we get it, the higher we get it, then the big bugs stop. And what the study showed was the plant actually gives a different glow, infrared off. And also if the bug actually tries to chew on, if the bricks is real high, it kind of puts them into an insulin coma. So then they don't want to bite on it because it makes them feel bad. Um, Duncan's Worm Farm, uh, when I started out, I have drowned worms. I have cooked worms. I have froze worms. So it's an easy process once you figure out how to do it. But there is some trial and error. Too much water, too soggy, it starts to sink and anaerobic. The worms escape. Um, just a bad home environment. Um, you get it too cold, they freeze. And if you get it too hot, they actually liquefy. It's Horrible smell. Um, so I had to find out where should we keep our worms. In Indiana, keeping them outside all year long is really hard to do. In the heat of July, I have to do cooling stations with frozen bottles of water. And then I put it in one area and when the worms are too hot, they go over toward the, fr the freezer. <laughs> and in the uh, winter, we had to make a heat source and I used those growing seed mats, heating mats, um, and kept it on one side and um, kept their food over there. So the composting of the food and then the little heater, um, they would go there to warm up. They still moved out around all of it, but when they're too cold, I would find them piled up underneath this little 12 by 8 mm -hmm. mat. Um, then there is such thing as overfeeding your worms. They get what they call protein poisoning, and it looks like little knots all over it. So you only can feed your worm bin as fast as they can chew up like a cup of food. They are ravenous, but if you just put too much and they don't have a way to get away from it, they'll get too much uh, protein. So we have topes that are big now. We started out in buckets. We just, I started out with stack buckets, the flow through system. And then uh, that kind of got to be too small and too many things to take care of. So you've got, you know, I had 20 stacks of buckets and you got to process all that. It kind of made it easy for uh, harvesting because I only had to pick up, you know, five gallon bucket of product versus, you know, a big old thing I got to scoop out. But, it turns out the bigger it is, it's actually the safer I found that it would be. Because like I said, they can get away from the protein because I feed on one side and they go out into their bedding and they come back. Um, so, and if they have it's too wet on one side, usually one side's drier because a lot of times where you feed them, it gets real soggy and wet. And then we learned how they breed. We went to Arizona Worm Farm and found out um, how to multiply your worms a little faster. So there is, I love the vermicompost. Um, it's very good. It, it, it's just, I started to dream about worms and I thought, well, why do I, why do I dream about worms? And so <laughs> I thought, well, I'll just be a bait shop. Well, then I said, what are good, what are worms good for? And that's how vermicompost came up to me. But there was nobody in Indiana that did vermicomposting so that's their only sole thing. They, usually the people who vermicompost were landscapers and they did it on the side or they were had their own garden and they just did their own personal one. Well, I was wanting to do big scale worm farming. So it was really hard. I had to go to Arizona to see it. So, all right. So this was, 
in 2020, Mark and I's basement. And we had uh, each one of these bins um, had worms in it. We had LED lighting in the back, just in case the worms got a little exploring. It, it, it detours them for, from crawling out uh, to get your bin started. Because usually once your bin started and your pH is good, your food's good, you've got it figured out, you don't have to do that anymore. So then we did the IBC totes outside. And that's where the trouble maintaining tips, temperatures came up. We had to use the heating pad and the frozen water in the summer. So it's not too bad. It's just in this every day, twice a day, you have to change out frozen bottle water. And I work full time as a nurse. So <laughs> it kind of got crazy. Stephanie, can I ask a quick question? I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, did you buy those units as you see here or are those? So we, yeah. So, so, no, we cut them in half. We, so they're cut in half. Yeah, what did you use? Just saw saw saw. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and then we, because their edges were a little rough, we put mm -hmm. those around it, but we don't use those anymore either. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, but. Oh, um, we use the toes, not the. Back. Right, yeah, we don't put that blue thing around the oh, top. Okay. Those are just those noodles. Um, but that we have bought, made sure we bought food grade. Everything we have had was street grade, even my buckets. Uh, my totes were from, I ordered those black tubs, dish, they're called dish tubs, you know, like you use a restaurant, and I ordered them for web, our, our web restaurant. <laughs> so, but the white buckets or food buckets you can get from um, uh, grocery stores, um, like from the bakery, uh, any bakery gets tons of those icing buckets. And they usually are trying to find something to do with them. And I didn't pay a dime for those. And I believe we paid $8 for the black totes. But that included a lid. Because believe it or not, they sell everything separate. <laughs> so here we are today. So we moved last March. And this is a 30 by 30 space in a pole barn. We have air conditioning. And then over here, which you can't see is a wood burner. We have a wood burner for winter. And we only had to use it when it had that real cold snap where it was super cold for week, 10 days. We ran that. We went through half a truckload of wood at least <laughs> to keep, because that is a, is it a 80 by? It's a 46 by uh, 64. Okay, 46 by 64 pole barn. So there's a lot. We use the tractor to help move we have forks that will lift. That's another good reason why you use the IBC totes because we can easily put the forks on the tractor and move them around. So, and then there is our cardboard that we recycle. Um, we use a um, paper shredder that we purchase off the Amazon. It needs to be a 20 page shredder and preferably one that has a straight shot down because we ordered 10. So if you ever get a paper shredder, from Amazon, and you have cardboard in the bottom, that's because I tried it out and sent it back. <laughs> um, because it, I found, we found that when they go at an angle, it's harder to insert the cardboard. So we had to buy one that went straight down. Like the, all our older ones went straight down, but now they're selling some sideways. I guess it's a safety feature, but safety's out the window now. <laughs> so, all right. So next slide. So, SAR sponsored us. Um, we made a lot of money, uh, not a lot of money, but how we got a lot of our startup funds was through grants. Um, this grant was a um, use of alternative um, rancher farmer grant um, utilization, of, utilization of worm tea on the field scale trials for soil remediation. So the government's trying to find us a different way to uh, fertilize our crops, soybeans, uh, anything that you would farm on large, large scale. Our farmer was Jason Mann Farms, and uh, we approached him. We did trivia at his bar, and he was a farmer, and he was talking to somebody. I don't really remember what, but he had this land that he had to re-terrace, and it's been seven years, 
and his soil is still, he's, it can't grow a whole crop. It just has tons of blank spots. So I, I approached him, we approached him one day and said, hey, we've got this product. And if I could get a grant, would you be willing to use our product on it? And so he went to his hand, uh, landowner and that guy actually was like, I was reading about this. I was wanting to try it. So um, that's how we landed our field. This is our field. It's in Mount Vernon, Indiana. It's near the river. And as you can see, it was, there's dead spots. Can you see where even the grass doesn't grow? Doesn't even grow grass. It's just dead. So, so this is how we set it up for the field study. So the outside, so we didn't put any warranty on. He could do what he wanted to. Our section here was uh, the first year we had to use a herbicide halfway through it. Well, not halfway through it. Before we planted, it was getting choked out. It was just, the corn was just, so we did that. Um, well, I think we tilled it. We tried tilling it first. And then we ended up having to do a uh, herbicide, but that was the only time we he had to use herbicide again. That was it. So May 8th, we planted the worm tea, uh, planted uh, with the treatment of worm tea extract. So um, these are some things that we use, and a lot of our stuff is trial and error. How do you get your product from, the, from your bucket that you just made tea with onto the big tractor? or into the sprayer if it's slower. So this Milwaukee pump was actually it was wonderful. Made our life a lot easier. Um, the sprayer had a seven, uh, not a nozzle boom on it with fine tip sprayers. We removed all the inline filters from the sprayer. However, it kept getting clogged, kept getting clogged, kept getting clogged. And what was catching is eggs make, uh, worms make eggs. So they're called cocoons. The cocoon shell, little bit in it, it can just fold up into like a little bit of contact. <laughs> and it was sucking through the little screen and then it would go into the cord and clog it all up. So that we didn't have clogs after that particular run again. So um, this is, we loaded our product, you can see here. And the pump is on there and our product that we mix by hand at the field site. It's called extract, loaded up into that. And I was so excited to see my worm tea spray, you know, inoculating the seed as it gets planted. Um, farmers are funny breed. They don't, but once they find something that works, that's what they want to do. They don't want to do anything different. Um, so here's our corn. It came up. We actually had a really good stance at day five. Um, he did it uh, 15 gallons an acre at 25 PS, uh, at six PSI. The corn had a good stance. He was really upset because it was crooked. He has one of those navigated um, planters. And, but since we were trying to plant a certain way, they kind of goofed it up. But, um, so that was our first plant. June 11, the front of the field, Looks pretty good. Uh, versus the back of the field. There, my, my funny joke is there I'm outstanding in my field. It, nobody ever thinks that's me. Um, but Mother Nature was not on our side. Um, it was drought. I don't know if you all had that around here, but we had very little water and very, very hot. So, and then we did not use any synthetic nitrogen. It was strictly that one spray of worm tea, and maybe it was only had, you know, that first application. So June 18th, we actually did a boiler spray, and we brewed tea. That's where you um, put your um, compost in a tea bag, and it's in unchlorinated water, and it has a bubble. We add aeration to it at a high rate uh, PSI, pushing the air out to really get all your microbes going. And we put um, fish emulsion in it and um, molasses, that's all for molasses. And we brew it for 24 hours 
before application. Um, but uh, September, oh, and we also didn't have any clogging of the sprayer at that time. Um, but the, it was difficult to harvest due to the panic of wheat. So because we hadn't really done a herbicide. Um, so October 14th, we planted winter, winter wheat. Um, like I said, he said he did a vertical tillage prior to the post broadcast plant. Um, we decided to use the winter wheat because it was a really good cover crop and he broadcast planted. And, um, it, it, and also we thought that was gonna be a really dense cover crop. So our microbes, when we spray on top of this, is gonna let them really thrive because too much sun kills your uh, microbes. Now the product is still good for its magnesium, phosphorus, nitrogen, um, even if uh, the sun hits it. But as far as live micro um, microorganisms, it, the sun kills them pretty quickly. So this gave us an advantage point to spray. And as you can see, we still had some water standing, but it's a full field. That's the first time he really had a full field ever in 15 years. So um, we did, because the field was so dead, we did probably three times the amount we really needed to use technically. But I feel like in, in um, this situation, we only had two years for the study that we needed to have some progress faster than average. So we did apply it pretty heavy. Um, then it's really important. Another note that we hadn't talked about is um, the transfer pump. We installed two inline screen filters. Um, they're little mini ones, you know, like what you put on your house, but they had a little screen in it and we hooked that up to the pump. One, it, well, actually we had three. We had one before it went in our pump and then two when it went out of our pump. And we, we, we went down to one on the um, before and one after. So, um, and then the important thing you really want to know because it is um, bio, it has a lot of biology in it, you need to clean. It's very important. Don't skip this step. When you're done with your pump, you're done with your mixer, your bucket, you need to put a little sanitizer in there and scrub all the bio gum off. So you want to use a container that's easy to scrub. Uh, because you really, you really need to do it. And, and the tractor, he ran leach water through it. He could not get down in there, get real scrubby, but um, it, didn't, it didn't seem to have a biofilm. <clears throat> and we learned about biofilm at, um, um, I think at Arizona, didn't we? Yeah, at Arizona uh, Worm Farm. It's one of the largest in the United States. And so that's, you know, that's another learning curve. So when I started this market, I, I had nobody around here that could tell you anything. Just the internet. And so, uh, okay. Like I said, there was no blank spots. But the yield was still low at that point comparatively to his other fields. But he was so pleased that he had a full crop. Uh, uh, we planted soybeans um, in uh, July. We applied, this would be your normal rate for that strip, 15 gallons of tea to the center strip. And it, we applied it late in the evening as well. So right before it got dark. So we're trying to get a really good. So the soybeans came up, no dead spots at all. He said, like he said, I thought he said no, first time in 15 years, but oh, I, wrote, he, I wrote down five. I don't know. <laughs> um, so... What are some important things uh, about your soil is biodiversity. And um, we inevitably struggle with this resource. We often take for granted, I know we all do, um, this biodiversity is overlooked, um, more specifically microorganisms and insects. Indiana, if you didn't know, um, 
has 23 million acres of farmland, and that's 65 percent in Indiana for agricultural purposes. That's uh, that's a lot. I, it's one of the highest uh, agricultural states. We're up there in the top five, probably. Um, over half of our soil in Indiana is known as soil erosion, specifically because the layer of the soil that helps maintain its structure turn allows for because it allows for proper water flow and nutrients. Additionally, the topsoil where the plants receive all their nutrients and organic matter and biodiversity is contained. So that's the name of this game is I wanted to make dirt soil again. I, I was raised on a farm and I could remember the soil being black and you could stick your hand all the way down in it. And now you go out there, you need a chisel. It's, it's just like rocks. Um, so here is the soil sample. Oh, it didn't shut up. Where did you go? Okay. So we had a mate, we did a, a, a made a, a full nutrient screening of our soil before we started. And, um, so that was in 2022. And, um, as you can see, um, nutrition, very low, and biodiversity, low, resistance, very low. I mean, it does have some good quality. And um, the thing that was high on it, like I said, was the herbicide and um, fungicide. and pest, the, All of the unnatural stuff, that was all that was there. So then, oh, hey, we just lost it. I got it. I think I can get back. Okay. There we go. Okay. And then if we click the start it from. Okay. I, I have this magnetic personality that does this. You're good. So slideshow. Slide. Is that what you want it to yep. be? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go one more. Okay. There we go. So this last test, we only did two of these. And let me tell you why we only did two of them, though. They're $750 test to get a biology test. And it takes forever. <laughs> but here is our last one that we did 2023. The major, major thing that has got everybody pumped up. We went from low to high in a year and a half. Spraying worm tea. Because they only did the soil sample right in our spot. So I was so excited um, because to get your things to grow, you need so soil biodiversity. Um, still, the nitrogen is a little low, but I do believe that if we do the right cover crops, continue with that, that's going to bring in your natural um, nitrogen. I'll try to get through some of all of this. Um, so where you we got our uh, soil test was, uh, you could see all that soil test um, at our, uh, this is our um, project code, and you go to SAR and put in that, um, you could see the um, project number and also what it is, and it's the vermicomposting for large-scale farming, soil remediation. Um, the future, as you know, is changing. Um, we've got, we had, to, the, the government is really trying to find an alternative fertilizer. As you know, getting nitrogen has like doubled or tripled in price. It's hard to get. Um, other countries currently have outlawed using artificial synthetic nitrogen because the nitrates go into the water table. So they are already implementing using worm vermicompost and manure and anything natural that is organic. Um, I felt like this is needed and we feel it will improve the quantity and quality of car crops. Farming for profit and not versus yield. So we did a big incentive to make your yield more, more, more. And now the value of the crop in many instances 
has very little nutritional value. 